All right, Numbers chapter 16 this morning, continuing our study of this particular book. And really, this study today, we're, we're going to touch on attitudes that we've dealt with previously with, with Moses and, and with Aaron and Miriam, excuse me, not Moses and, and Aaron, but Miriam and, Moses and Aaron. I'm getting my words all confused this morning. When we, were, when we look back on our study of Numbers 12, when Miriam and Aaron opposed Moses, what was their basic disposition? Why did, they, why did they accuse Moses of what they did? They wanted the power. They wanted to be, they wanted the recognition. They wanted to be like Moses. They wanted, the, they wanted to be the leader. Exactly, Sister Gail. And, and, and they had forgotten that God had appointed them to their own particular roles. What, in fact... What role was Aaron functioning in at that particular time? And high, priest. high priest. I mean, that's a pretty important role, was it not? And Miriam was, was a what? Prophetess. Prophetess. So it wasn't like that God had not been favorable to them. But again, what was the basic attitude they possessed which led them They were jealous. They, they were envious. And, and, that, and that's the same problem we're going to see here today. But this time we're approaching it not from the standpoint of, of Moses' own family, but from outside sources, from within the congregation of, of, of Israel. And I would suggest to you when it comes to having being jealous or envious of those in position of authority, that jealousy, that envy, really stems from the attitude, would it not, of I can do things better than they? Well, they don't know what they're doing, and I think I know what I'm doing, and so I need to be in that position because I can do the job better than they can. Yeah, I recently experienced that. That's what I was going to, you know. With an employee, uh, she thought she thought she could do things better. She actually wanted my job better. Yeah, and that's... And, they're jealous, they're envious, and as a result, they lust or covet after what's that position. And I think that's why we see so much disrespect for authority. It's because people believe they can do, do the task better than those who have been placed in charge. And that's what we're going to see here today with, with the example of Korah and his sidekicks, Dathan and Abiram. And we're, also, we're going to see their rebellion against Moses, and then we're going to see the reactions to this willful and presumptuous action on the part of Korah. And again, it's something God had warned against in Numbers 15. And this study today is going to set the stage, really, for, for next, next week's lesson, the consequences uh, of such rebellion. And so I want to begin this morning, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to skip down to verses 12 through 14. And let's look at their rebellion. If someone would, let's begin by reading verses 1 through 3. Thank you, Sister Gail. First of all, let's look at verses 1 and 2. So we think about verse 1. I think verse 1 is key in this whole section. Because we're told of, of, of what tribe was Korah? Korah was a Levite. And Dathan and Abiram were of which tribe? Reuben, exactly right. Exactly right, Sister Nana. They were, of, they were of Reuben. Now, we are also told that Korah was a descendant of the Kohath, 
Kohathites. Now they were the attendants to the priests, and they helped with the transport of the tabernacle and assisting in the offering of sacrifices. And again, would we not say that this was an important responsibility? Indeed it was. Now, in my study, I think we can. there's two possible ulterior motives as to why Korah was, was going to do what he was going to do here. Number one, if you read on page 37 of our book, our book notes that Korah was convinced that he should share in the authority of Moses. And I think you, you pointed this out earlier, Sister Gail. He, you know, Miriam and Aaron wanted more authority. And so it could be the case here that Korah thought he should share in the authority of Moses as well as the privileges of Aaron. In all likelihood, he wanted to replace them. And it could be the case that he wanted to abolish the distinction between the priests, the family of Aaron, and the rest of the tribe of Levi. And remember, all priests were of the tribe all, were Levites, but not all Levites were priests, as seen here with, with Korah. And certainly the Reubenites would join in with Korah in that perhaps they felt they had a claim to the priesthood over Levi because they were descendants of the firstborn, Jacob. And so Korah starts all of this, and, and, I, and this is his influence, would we not say? Korah's the ringleader. And so what's his influence leading to? A confrontation. Now notice verse 2. They approached Moses with how many, how many men? 250. Notice how they're described. Were they just 250 regular men? 250 princes? King James has men of renown, famous. And, and really that, that's the idea of they were official representatives of the congregation. They were not a group of rebellious ruffians, but men of rank. But what does this tell us about their attitude, seeing that these were men of rank, and yet they are joining in with Korah's little rebellion? They had a oh, they had a problem. They went along with the crowd. Going along with the crowd. And what does the Bible say? What was one of the commands God gave Israel? Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do what? To do evil. And was this not what these men were doing? Was following Korah to do evil against Moses and Aaron? Indeed it was. Now verse 3 has part of their accusations. But also at this time want us to read verses 12 through 14 before we deal with the actual accusations as well. If someone would read these three verses. Thank you, Sister Cindy. When we look at these four verses, I've really found five different accusations that, that they bring against Aaron and Moses. And from verse number three, the first accusation is, well, you take too much upon you. Now, what are they trying to say here? And, uh, and really, this is the same argument, is it not, that, that Miriam and Aaron made against Moses back in Numbers 12, is it not? You take too much upon you, Moses? And, and in this context, I would suggest they felt that Moses had too much power, too much authority, and thus was guilty of not wanting to share what belonged to all. And, um, and they forget that Moses and Aaron was divinely appointed by God to these roles, did they not? So this is not a laughing matter. 
Now look at the latter portion of this verse as well. Not only do they say that they took too much upon them, what else do they accuse Moses and Aaron of here in this verse? No, and making himself a prince or exalting themselves. I thought too that that was probably probably a little uh, a little dig at Moses as to how he was brought up, being brought up as a prince in the in Pharaoh's house. That could be. I didn't think of that as I was looking, and it could be a subtle dig. To, well, you make yourself a prince. You know, sort of appealing like, well, you grew up in the house of Pharaoh, and now you call yourself an Israelite? So it serves as a dig in, in, you know, not just a dig, but it could be an insult as well, would we not say? But, um, so that's accusation number two, and, you know, and we could spend a lot of time on that. Now look at verse 13, the third accusation. And, um, and again, they rightly describe the land as flowing with milk and honey, but they accuse Moses of leading them from Egypt to do what in the wilderness? To kill them. And again, is this the first time that this accusation had been placed upon Moses? They were oppressed. They were slaves. And remember our study from a couple, couple of weeks ago when the spies spied out the land? Remember what they wanted to do? They didn't want to go into the land. Where did they want to go? Back to Egypt. Because they thought they'd been brought out into the wilderness to die. So we see this same accusation time and again brought against Moses. And, and Korah, Korah and his merry band of rebellions are using the old, same old line of, of argumentation. And so, so that's accusation number three. Again, we also see the, the, this accusation of making himself a prince over them or lording over them. That's the fourth one. And finally, the idea of, you know, wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? In them. Um, this is the idea that they were accusing Moses of, of attempting to blind the people to his real intentions. In other words, what did they think Moses was going to do to the people? Well, I think it's clear he was trying to deceive them into thinking that, yeah, we're going to, he's going to, we're, I'm going to bring you into the promised land, but in essence, I'm going to kill you. And that's what, they're, what, that's what they were accusing them of. But in reality, is this not what Korah and these others were doing to the people here? Was blinding them? Perpetuating a lie against them? Now, with that in mind, let's look at the reaction to all of this. And this basically takes in verses 4 through 11, and then verses 15 through 22. And first of all, let's, let's look at Moses' disposition to all of this. What does he do in verse 4? He falls on his face. Now, what does this signify? What does Moses's, what does Moses's disposition, what does Moses' action here signify? Well, he can pray, but when you when he falls on his face, what does that indicate to us about it? Well, he's humbling. He's humbling himself. He, you know, and it, we're told as soon as he heard it, he fell on his face. And uh, mm -hmm. did Moses know the gravity of the situation? Oh, no doubt. He'd been through this, and so he knew what it was going to lead to, didn't he? What happened, with that? what happened to Miriam when she tried this little stunt? Leprosy. Now, she was cured, but that's after Aaron interceded for her. So Moses knew, did he not, just based on experience, that this was not going to end well for these individuals, didn't he? 
And so we might say that Moses was saddened by the whole ordeal. Now look at verse number 15. Look at the very first phrase of verse 15. Moses, it describes Moses as well. After they say these words of verses 12 through 14, we're told after they speak these words, when they refuse to come up, Moses, get, Moses is what? He is angry. And, and again, this is not a selfish anger, is it? What is he angered by? What caused Moses to become angry? Their disrespect, their lack of appreciation for what God had done for them. Exactly, Sister Roberta. So he's angered by their disrespect for God, by their rebellion against God. And um, so his anger is a righteous indignation because he recognizes that their rebellion wasn't against him, was it? They weren't rebelling against Moses, but they were rebelling against whom? Against God himself. And so this is, this is why Moses is angry. And so, so that's his disposition. We see sadness initially, and then by the actions of these individuals, he becomes just angry at the situation because of their actions against God. Now look at verse number 5. Look, what does, Moses, what does Moses say to them? What does he speak into, to Korah and to, all, and to all his country? What's his instructions? What's he going to say? And set apart. Exactly, Sister Nana. So, is this not a challenge laid down by Moses? A challenge to the rebels in which God would decide the matter? Moses is saying, here's what we're going to do. Here's what's going to happen, and I'm not going to make the decision. This is out of my hands, but we're going to go through with this, and you're going to find out for yourself whom really has been chosen because God's going to decide the matter. Now what does he tell them to do in verses 6 and 7? Bring your censers. Yep, take your censers and, and do what? We're going to bring them before the Lord. With fire their own. And, and, and when in that fire they were to put incense in them. And um, Now what was the purpose of this test or this challenge? What was this designed to do? Mm -hmm. And it would decide to whom the leadership and the priesthood belonged, would it not? Just who belonged in these roles. And, and again, God was going to answer these questions. And, and remember, did Korah and these others have a right to do what they did? No. No. And so Moses is challenging them, as it were, to do what they claim to have a right to do. And again, God would make known if they were set apart for this service as they claimed. God would make known if they were set apart to, do, to lead the children of Israel or to serve as the high priest as they so claimed. And again, the answer would come from God. And, and so Moses, Moses gives them this. Now also look at verses 8 through 11. And, and here we have, a seri we have some, a series of questions. And it begins in verse 8 with Moses telling Korah, as it were, you, you know, listen up. And he's not just addressing Korah, but he's addressing all who are involved in the matter. Now why do you think he tells them to listen up? What's Moses wanting them to do? What's, it, what's the goal of him saying, exhort, saying, listen up now? Exactly, Sister Gal. He wanted, them to un, he wanted them to think about what they were doing, did he not? 
you know, when we, we, you know, we get involved with others and we see them doing things they, that we know they ought not to be doing, and what's the first thing that we try to do, do when we see these things occurring? Reason with them. You know, I, you know, even in the church, you, you know, you see people doing it. You see preachers teaching things they ought not to be doing. First thing you do is try to reason with them. You know, think about what you're doing. Try to come to understand the, the consequences of what you're doing. And, 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 this is what you'd, and this is what Moses is trying to do here, is trying to get them to use basic common sense to act rationally and to see the folly of their way. Look at verse number 9 now. And someone, someone, if someone would, read verse number 9. Actually, read verses 9, 9 through... Read verses 9 and 10. Let's get these questions here. Someone would, read these two verses for us. Thank you, Brother Carl. Look at verse number 9. Moses asks, is it, this is in the form of a question, what does Moses correctly recognize regarding Korah and these men? What had God done for them? What had God, what had God done, did for them? What, what, what had happened to them? And, uh, and yet they viewed it as what? Not good enough. Not good enough. And isn't that the problem? And, and isn't this, you know, and this is where, you know, this is how jealousy and envy grows. We talked, you know, remember a couple weeks ago we had that sermon on this. And isn't this how envy grows is we view things as not good enough. We got to have, it's like a lust for more, more, and then more. And so envy and covetousness, I, you know, just based on that definition, really almost go hand in hand, do they not? And so Korah and, his, and these men, they had a special role, especially Korah. But Korah didn't think it was good enough. But Moses here is telling them, hey, be grateful, be thankful, you know, for the opportunity given to you by God. Be, be grateful for the special place you've been given. You know, and again, when we think about envy and jealousy, isn't a basic reason um, for the cause of envy a lack of gratitude? Yeah, you don't count your blessings. We sing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. If we were to stop and if we were to just simply stop and count our blessings, would we not be thankful for all that God has done for us? Yes. Do you think Korah would have been thankful for, for the for the for the opportunity God had given him to be involved in the service of the tabernacle? Should have been. Should have been. And I th and it possibly would have been if he had a spirit of gratitude. The spirit of ingratitude leads to a spirit of jealousy and in and, and envy. And it leads to other sins. In fact, verse 10, you know, Moses exposes their true motivation, does he not? What does he point out that they were seeking? He's point, he points out that they wanted the priesthood for themselves. Is there any hiding of their true intentions at this point? Nope. God knew and Moses knew. And so, verse 11, Moses says, For which cause that, that you and your company, that you're gathered against God. In other words, they were not only standing against Moses, 
But who else were they standing against? Against God. Now they were in a, they started a fight, did they not? They started a proverbial fight. Were they going to win this fight? Question, when men fight against God and His will, are we going to win? No. No, that's a fight we're going to lose. And, uh, it, you know, what does fighting against God and His will bring? Misery. Misery and destruction. You can't win when, you, when God's against you. You know, we appeal to Romans 8.31, if God be for us, who can be against us? And the answer is no one. Now flip that. Flip that verse. And let's think about that verse in, in reverse now as we think about the situation here. If God be against us, who can be for us? No one. You know, it's a, you know, it's a terrible, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, is it not? And that's what Korah and Dathan and Abiram were doing. They were going to fall into God's hands due to this little rebellion. Because they were fighting against God. Now we come back to verse number 15. We've already pointed out Moses' anger, but he also petitions God. And he asks God to do what? Here. Yeah, don't accept their offering. Now, why does he ask God to not respect their offering? Exactly, Sister Donna. But also Moses here, he pleads with God to recognize that he has been, that he himself has been above board this whole time. Had he done anything to Korah? Had he done anything personally to these men? No. So Moses is appealing to his, own, to his integrity as well. Again, verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17 really... Re reiterate the instruction that, that Moses had already given to Korah and his crew regarding what was going to happen. Again, verse 16, we ha it's the reminder, the purpose of the trial and how it would be accomplished by fire. And they had that responsibility to bring their fire in their censer and to put incense their own, according to verse 17. In verses 18 and 19, we, we have them this actually taken place. And as soon as this occurs, as soon as they took the censers, put the fire there in them, and laid the incense their own, and they came to the door of the tabernacle, what happened? God, is, God arrives. His glory appears at the, unto all the congregation. Now look at verse 20. Does he speak at this time to the entire congregation? No, he tell, he's he he pulls he tell he's going to speak only to Moses and Aaron. Aaron, and so verses twenty through twenty two. Here we have Je Jehovah's decision in the matter. Verse twenty, we see to whom God spoke. Now look at verse twenty one. Someone read this verse for us. Here we go again. God's anger manifested. His wrath is going to be kindled. First off, what does he tell Moses and Aaron to do? Get out of there. And that's, you know, when you separate yourself, that's what you do. You get out of a situation, you know, or you, or you break, a, break a relationship, you know. And, and again, that's what sin does to our relationship with God. It breaks it. It severs it. That's why it's referred to as separation, so God tells Moses and Aaron, you, you get away, you separate, you leave this entire situation. 
Now, why were they to separate? Mm -hmm. God is, yet again, God has had it with the whole nation, has he not? This ain't, the, last week we saw what God wanted to do. What, when we looked at last week, did, is, it, is not the wording here similar to what God told Moses last week when we studied about the consequences of their refusing to go into the land of Canaan because of unbelief? That he wanted to destroy them? Yeah. Right. Everyone 20 and up could not, or I believe it was 20. I'd have to, I may be wrong on that. They weren't going to be allowed to enter the room. But he told Moses he wanted to start all over with him. And he's here, again, he's saying here he's, Wants to wipe out the entirety of the nation. Again, his, Israel's test, Israel tested God's patience, did they not? They really pushed his patience to the, to the end. But again, let's read verse 22. God says, I'm going to destroy Israel. So you get out of there, Moses and Aaron. Let's look at what Moses does. Let's look at what Moses and Aaron do. Someone would read verse 22 for us. Thank you, Sister Carolyn. And again, does this not reveal to us the kind of individuals Moses and Aaron were? That they were willing to plead to God on behalf of this stubborn and rebellious people? Now, were Moses and Aaron sinlessly perfect? Absolutely not. We know that. But they were men of faith, and they had concern for others. Here they plead with God yet again. And they appeal to him, don't destroy the entire nation just due to the sin of one man. And, and who do you think that one man, man Moses is referring to here is? Korah. Korah. Could it be that, could it be that he, he is affirming that Korah is the ringleader of this charade? And that he was to bear the primary responsibility for what had transpired? Do you, think, do you think this whole situation would have occurred if Korah had not done what he did? If he decided he needed some more power, do you think it would have occurred? It probably would. What's that, Brother Carl? Probably would not. But do we not see the, the influ, you know, do we not see the power our influence has? You know, we talk about the influence we can have for good, but here we see the problem of evil influence, do we not? And we've talked about, we've seen that the last couple of weeks too with the ten spies. They influenced the whole nation to believe their report. And so we need to be careful with our influence. And again, you think about this prayer, by this time. It is estimated that the population of Israel was over one million people. Can we see why Aaron and Moses would pray thusly then? God says, I'm going to wipe out the whole nation other than you and your families, Moses and Aaron. If this number is true, he will, he, his desire and his anger, he was going to judiciously remove one million people due to sin. But again, we see the intercession on the part of, of Moses and, and, and Aaron. And, uh, again, the, and again, God would spare Israel. But does this mean that he was finished with the situation? Well, no, Korah is going to have to experience the consequences. And that's going to be the study for next week. But as we think about this section, you, you notice on page 39 and 40 of our book, under the conclusion section, we find that 
The rebellion against Moses and Aaron was no spontaneous uprising. Korah was a Levite, Dathan and Abiram were Reubenites. Their lust for power had a great deal to do with their resentment because God had chosen Moses as leader of the people and Aaron as priest. But when a few people are disgruntled, strife can spread like wildfire. Under the best of circumstances, it is difficult to inspire and motivate people for spiritual service. And is this not the danger? And is this not the the power of influence as we have talked about? Corrupt good morals. Exactly, Sister Nana. Exactly. And Korah gathered a bunch of birds. And this was due to his jealousy and envy. And the reason why envy causes so much trouble is clearly explained in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. It's the result of a proud look. It leads one to being swift and running to mischief, creating havoc and trouble, as Korah did. It results in a heart that devises wicked imaginations, and certainly Korah devised wicked imaginations, false accusations against Moses and Aaron. It resulted in speaking lies against others. We've seen that. It produces discord among brethren. Korah and his merry band of henchmen certainly did that with Israel. And it leads to destruction. And we're going to see next week in our study the end result of Korah's little rebellious attitude. 